A lot of designers say that will be replaced. If you don't know how to use AI, then you absolutely will lose your job. AI doesn't work on its own. It has to be usable as well. We have to design it well. Do you think relying too much on AI at the beginning of their career will make them lazy or less creative? If you're in a design school that doesn't um, you know, teach you how to use AI properly, uh, you know, you're in a bad design school. If you're just a low-level person just starting, you can't afford to hire another person just to help you. But you can definitely have, afford to hire an AI to help. But you have to be able to say what you're, what you're aiming for because it, it can't do you no know, mind reading, at least not yet. What are some skills and mental models that students yeah. should practice moving forward? If there's a lot of features but people cannot understand how to use them, they might as well not exist. Our ultimate goal is to save humanity from being oppressed by computers. And you've been in the game for 41 years? Yes, absolutely. Welcome to The Cutting Edge Show. Today's guest is Sir Jacob Nielsen, one of the world's most influential designers and founder of UX Tigers. Sir Jacob is the mastermind behind Jacob's Law and has laid down multiple rules that every web and UI designer learns in design school. In 1998, he was featured in the New York Times as the guru of web page usability. He has more than 75 US patents, all on designing interfaces with better UX and usability. Nielsen's list of 10 human heuristics is probably the most used usability framework for UI design. In this episode, Jacob Sir gives answers to the most important questions and doubts UX designers have when they start their careers. How do I grow as a designer? Can AI take our jobs? How do we prepare for the future? How does Jacob Sir use AI and prompt engineering? So without wasting any further time, let's get started. Good evening, Mr. Nielsen. It is an honor for me to host you on The Cutting Edge Show. I have been looking forward to this conversation for the past one month. Even my students have been so hyped that we're finally hosting you. So how has it been so far? Oh, it's been great so far. And I definitely thank you for, for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to this. How has it been like growing UX Tigers? Because I know that that is your latest place. That is the new hot place to learn from you. Right. So what logic behind it? Well, the logic was that I had spent many years you know, as a consultant and been focusing on growing the business and hopefully serving clients well, that would be my hope. But that really put a cramp on my creativity and my ability to just write what I want without worrying about offending anybody. And so when I retired from my previous company, I thought, well, now is the chance. You know, Now I can have my own, own operation that's called UX Tigers. Um, and I can write what I want, and I really feel that I have a huge upsurge in creativity that I have not, to be honest, had the last few years. Um, part is because there's so many new things, exciting things happening that I can analyze and talk about, and, but it's also just in general because I don't have that administrative burden anymore that honestly is a lot of work to run a company, and now it's a very small company, so now it's not a lot of work, and therefore I can focus on doing creative work, uh, putting out new content, new information, new insights, and helping, you know, I really want to help millions of user experience people around the world, and by doing that, billions of users around the world. That has really always been my mission, and so that, I think, is is what I'm, what I'm really trying to do now. And what kind of articles do you write on, and what is this new exciting stuff that you've been talking about? Yeah, well, I write about, uh, a lot of it writes is about artificial intelligence, because that is the real boom that's happening right now and a true change, a true revolution. And I feel like if I compare with other revolutions during my career, I've done user experience now for 41 years. And so the first revolution was the PC, a personal computer revolution, and the graphical user interface as in Microsoft Windows, Apple Macintosh, those those type of platforms. And that was very different from the old mainframes and the text-based uh, interfaces like DOS or Unix that went before, very different. The next revolution was the internet revolution, which is like all the websites, all of a sudden people could connect to millions of different places of information. Also a big revolution compared to just having your PC with only your own local information. So those are two big revolutions. So the third revolution is now the AI revolution. And I think that is a bigger revolution than the other two, even though they were they were big, I mean, they were really big. And user interfaces were very different after PC than before PC and also after web compared to before web. But the third change now is, is AI. And I think it's a more fundamental change 
Because it's not just a matter of how do the buttons look on the screen that is important, but it's more important that we are now, I, I really want to equate it more with the industrial revolution than with the PC revolution. So changing the economy, not just changing how we use computers, even though it's certainly doing that. The industrial revolution though was a revolution of physical things being done with machine power instead of human power, right? Um, and AI revolution is the revolution of intellectual work being done not just by biological computer brain or human brains, but by uh, computers. So we have, this is what's called artificial intelligence, which is a rather, I think, not necessarily really a great word. It is similar to like inventing the steam engine. And that is a huge thing. And then I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of additional innovations happening over the next maybe 10 years or so. Similar to, let's say, to go back to the steam engine. Well, okay, somebody invents the steam engine. That's a great invention right there. Then some years later, some other guy thinks, maybe we take a steam engine and we put it on the wheels and we run it on tracks and now we have a locomotive. And, and, th and that's just one more innovation. Then there's like 50 or hundreds of thousands, really, more innovations that in, in the physical world, in, the, in that manufacturing space. And now I think it's the same we're going to get in the intellectual space, which again, if you think about the world economy, today, knowledge work is what drives the economy. And so having a revolution in the knowledge economy is absolutely enormous. I cannot really. And so I think that AI, I call it the forklift for the mind. It lifts us up. And it, it, it's a little bit similar to the industrial revolution with a physical forklift in the warehouse. Before that, to work in a warehouse, you have to be a very strong guy to lift these heavy boxes and move them around. And now anybody can drive a forklift. Oh, no, no, you don't have to be very strong. You have to know where you're going. Uh, just as with AI, you have to know what you want to accomplish. But it's a true revolution. So that's what's making me very, very excited. And that's why I've written a lot of articles on UX Tigers about uh, that big change. Now, I also write articles about other things like a lot of more traditional user experience things like why you should care about usability and the 10 usability heuristics and all those other things are, st are still very important because AI doesn't work on its own. It has to be usable as well. We have to design it well. So I write about those things too. But uh, how do you address that fear of designers feeling outdated and a lot of designers say that will we be replaced? What are your views on that? Yeah, well, I think if you are outdated, you will be replaced. And so therefore your goal is to not be outdated. And I think that anybody can learn AI. I mean, you don't have to be like a humongous you know, scientist and know all the details of the inside of it. Just as in the past, you didn't have to know how, let's say, Photoshop was implemented or how Figma was implemented to use those tools. So it's just a tool. It's just a very powerful tool. And so you have to understand how to use the tool in, in this case for design, or in another example, if you're a lawyer, you have to understand how to use AI to write up if you are like doing a divorce for somebody or you're doing a, a, a will for somebody, you have to know how to use AI and how not to use AI as well. But for any given job, you have to know how to use AI. If you don't know how to use AI, then you absolutely will lose your job because the people who do know how to use AI will be about twice as productive. I mean, the productivity gains from using AI are incredibly big. So right now they're more on the order of 40%, but I'm predicting really it will grow to about 100% for knowledge work over this 10-year this period that I'm talking about because we just started. And so the first design is ne never the best design. And that's an old lesson from user experience, right? You always start with something primitive, you iterate and you make it better. And so I definitely believe that the next version and the version after that, they're all going to get better. And therefore, right now, we see about 40% productivity increase, which is already enormous. If person A can do the work 40% faster than person B, you hire person A. But if person A can do it twice as fast as person B, there's no discussion. You will never ever bother with working with person B. And so that's why you don't want to be person B in this scenario. You want to be person A. And you can't. So it's just a matter of starting now. So if you're fearing, you fear being outdated because you don't know how to use AI, you start now. Just as soon and finish listening to this podcast. But once you're done with this, go and right away, go and log into something like ChatGPT or MidJourney or some of those tools and just start using them right away. And of course, the first time you use them, uh, the results may not be that great. But that's the same as the first time you use any other tools. So don't be discouraged by that. It takes a little experience and learning, but not that much because they're honestly not that difficult to use. So if there's a person B watching this video yeah. and that person opens up chat GPT or mid journey, yeah. what should be the next step? How do they practice using AI in their day-to-day -day work? I think that you start 
Start small, and therefore you start now. Start small, start now. That's my slogan in this situation, because if you want to start with an enormously big project, that's a scary thing, and it's a, there's a lot of barriers to do a full project with AI support. But you can do a small project. And when I say project, I don't even mean a project as such. I mean things like if you're, if you're doing, let's say, a, a presentation, um, you can go and get, let's say, 10 different suggestions for, for the heading or for some different bullet points for PowerPoint. Or if you're going to do, let's say, a storyboard, uh, you'll go to Midjourney and say, give me like 10 different uh, pictures of this thing. And then again, most of it will be bad. That's one of the lessons from AI is that the quality is highly variable, but that's okay. We have to like embrace the randomness and the probabilistic nature of AI because it means that you, you just ask for 10 things. Now, if you were working with a human, a human illustrator or a human copywriter, you cannot just ask, give me 10 headlines or give me 20 headlines or give me 50 different illustrations for the one thing you want. I mean, the expense would be horrendous. But with AI, you just type in, give me 10 headlines, or you could actually just say, give me 20 headlines. It costs you the same to write 10 or 20. It takes the AI two seconds more, and you've got 20 ideas. Now, of those 20 ideas, you can probably immediately reject half of them as being bad. The other half are inspiration. That's that's where you, you, you get new ideas. So AI, because it does, it stretches, I would say, it stretches your creativity. Sometimes it stretches it in ways that are just obviously stupid should be rejected. Other times it goes in weird ways that may or may not work. And other times it just goes in clearly beneficial ways. And so you don't own advance, but that's why you ask for a lot of ideas. Ideation is free. Ideation is free. It did not. It used to be expensive to come up with many ideas because it takes a long time to then think about it. And as you start thinking, you tend to kind of move down this path. But AI just go boom, 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 boom in all the different directions. And... Uh, that is extremely creativity enhancing. Uh, but but to what you should start by doing, you start by doing something small. It could also be like if you're writing an important email, give me 20 subject lines for that email. You pick the best one um, rather than writing it yourself. So those small things, you can also use it in your 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 personal life. Like one of my, my good friends, uh, Sarah Gibbons, came up with this concept that you can just use it for, get ideas for, for, for movies to watch in the evening or some other things that are, not so important, but just where you can exercise that creativity and just try different ideas. Um, so if you can do it in your personal life where the, I guess the risk is not so big, you can also use it in your professional life for small things where again, the risk is not so big. Then next week, you scale up and you do a little bit bigger thing. And the week after that, maybe you start to doing some kind of like what you might call real work, real design projects. For a person who has been doing this for a while, AI can help as a co-pilot, but then there are a lot of beginner students who are seeing AI as a shortcut. Do you think relying too much on AI at the beginning of their career will make them lazy or less creative? Probably, well, I mean, of course, there's always a risk, right? And the risk is mainly if you don't engage your own human creativity, your own human judgment, because judgment becomes more important, actually, when you get a lot of ideas to choose from, because how do you make that choice? So the lazy thing is to just ask ChatGPT, you know, make this web page for me or write this article for me. That's certainly lazy and you will get something that's reasonably good that way because it has decent quality already. Uh, and next year it'll have better quality. But the point is that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to break down the project in smaller parts, ask for a lot of different ideas and pick the best ones and then put them together yourself. And if people do that, I mean, I think there's a lot of analogies from the past of if you give students a tool that it's not bad. So for example, the calculator. Now I'm old enough that, you know, you know things like this, the calculator, right? Um, when I was in, in high school, there was a debate, there was literally a debate about whether it was good or bad for high school's kids or to have a calculator. Would that make them lazy and not be able to do calculations on their own? And in some sense it did because you're not probably today Students are not probably as good as in their head doing like multiplying five digit numbers together or things like that as maybe they were 80 years ago, let's say before my time. You know, 80 years ago, I'm sure they were better. But I can tell you from this personal experience that just using a calculator has not made me worse at math, which is what matters, or at understanding big numbers versus small numbers. Or if we take a business example, you need to understand kind of your, like your budget. Where is this company making a lot of money? Where is it making a little money? Should I cancel this project because it's not making a lot of money? Well, those type of understanding magnitudes, what's big, what's small, and relationships, and if I get this money per month 
what do I get per year? Well, maybe you cannot multiply by 12 in your head anymore, but then you can do it in Excel. And that's what the computer is for, is for those mechanical part of the calculation. Uh, understanding what numbers mean is what's the human responsibility. And I feel like you actually have more ability to, un to understand numbers by not spending your time. It takes a lot of time to do this calculation by hand. So that's not necessary. It's not been necessary for 50 years, you know, since I was a kid. And um, I think it's similar here. You get computer tools, they will do things that in the past was, were done by hand. That does not mean that using the computer tools makes you lazy, it makes you smart. You know, that's just one of those saying is don't work harder, work smarter. And I feel that's an exactly an example of that. Do you think this will also change the way design schools run and how design education runs in general? Oh, it absolutely should. I would actually say that even today, if you're in a design school that doesn't, uh, you know, teach you how to use AI properly, uh, you know, you're in a bad design school. It's it's similar to if they if they said you can you can never use you know a computer computer tool to make any graphics. You have to draw everything by hand and a ruler and and by different different pencils and things like that. I'm sure it's actually good to do some projects that you do only by hand to get some feeling for that, but um, it shouldn't be the, the, the norm. It shouldn't be what you mainly do. And definitely if the design school that bans using computer tools to, to make, to make uh, uh, pictures, it would be the same as saying that was in high school that say you can't use a calculator to use to do any, to deal with numbers. It's the same point that you want to use the tools that make you powerful and that take away the grunt work. And it's actually a great example of that, not in design as such, but rather in programming or implementation. Because the studies have been done on the co-pilot for, for GitHub. They actually show that the programmers who do use the, this AI tool, two things. First of all, they are much more productive. Actually, this is where the productivity gains are more than 100%. So people create more than twice as much code in the same amount of time with this AI tool. Hypothetically, you might say, but... That would mean that these poor programmers now feel very hassled and harassed and depressed over, over so they work so fast, so fast, so fast, and they don't have time to think. The opposite. It frees them from all that grunt work and the low-level part of coding. It means that they can think about the bigger picture. It means that they are what's called in the flow, which is a kind of a psychological thing that I'm creative. I'm, I'm, it's a different type of creativity to be a programmer, but it is absolutely creative. So it puts you in that mode where you're just making things happen, not when you're figuring out, should uh, do I, is there three or four parameters? This is a comma or a semicolon that should be put here. Come on. That's not what a talented programmer should spend their time on. And so this is empirical data that want to know how happy people are. There's only one real way of, of figuring out is to ask them. So how satisfied are you? And so the job satisfaction scores are higher when people actually produce more because AI takes away the grunt work, make them focus on the creative work, the higher level work. Uh, that's the data, data from programmers, but it's actually the same in, in other areas. I can even feel it myself that I feel more happy, more, more happy, more fun when I can make things move and happen and I can think about these bigger picture things, not about the grunt work or like how do I spell this word or those type of things, which are low level. Uh, oh, okay, this another example. Are people lazy because they have a spelling checker rather than, you know, having to go and look up in a dictionary how a word is spelled? No, they just write faster. They actually write better because they can focus on what they want to say, not about how to go up and look a word in a book that takes a f 10 times as long time as the computer does it for them. That's very interesting. It's Really nice to see you being so optimistic about it as well, yeah. because I think that is the way to go. Uh, but sir, a lot of students in our community are self-taught designers, yeah. and they usually don't have enough bandwidth to spend money on courses and design schools. Yeah. So how should a self-taught designer learn all of these things? Because this student is already scared about learning design alone, and now this student has to learn design and AI. So how will this kid do all of it? Well, I mean, I think you learn the two things together. Um, and the lucky thing about AI is that uh, the tools are right now relatively cheap, so people can actually buy them for their, themselves. And there's even free versions, though I have to say that if you can at all afford, right now it costs about $20 a month, which I know in some countries is a lot of money. But uh, if you can at all afford those $20, it's well worth it. And if you cannot afford it, there is the free version. However, it is not as good. It just has to be said, it is not as good with the free version. I mean, there's a reason they charge for, for version 4, GPT-4, and they give you 3.5 for free because 4 is better than 3.5. It's not just a numbers game. It actually is better. But but I think that you learn, you, you basically learn by, by doing it. 
there's not a lot of theory. Well, there's a theory if you want to be an AI scientist and invent, you know, a GPT-5. That's a lot of complicated theory. But if you just want to use them, there's not really a lot of theory to that. I mean, there's a little bit you sort of understand understand about so-called prompting and how you describe what you want. But mainly you just try. You, you say, I give me this. And if you get something back that's not what you wanted, you change how you you communicate with this tool. Uh, it's so it is a natural language tool, but that doesn't mean that there's no skill to how you communicate with it. I mean, you still have to figure out like what's a good way to ask for things, what's a bad way to ask for things, what are things that you can actually ask for. Like you can ask for, give me ten versions of this, and it just spits out ten different versions. Or you can say, give me ten very different versions, and then they become more different. Or you can say something like this: say, well, make it more whatever direction you want to move in, and it'll create a new version that moves in the direction you ask it for. And so those are relatively easy in terms of, I would say, the implementation in terms of just doing it. It's just typing in some 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 words. Um, I want to say, though, that that's not true for everybody. I mean, there's a lot of people who are not very articulate and are not very good at language. But for people, I mean, particularly I think designers have this built-in ability to kind of envision things and then kind of I have it in my brain, but how should it be in the world? So that transition between your brain and the world is how inherently something designers are good at. But you have to be able to say what you are what you are aiming for because it, it can't do you no know, mind reading, at least not yet. So so you have to tell it what you want. But you can you don't have to tell it what you want in some obscure syntax like with old computers. I mean, you just tell it in in natural language. So it's not that complicated and you just try and if you fail, so what? You just try again. And that's, I think, is the beauty of AI is that it encourages experimentation and encourages lots of variability and different versions and, I say, ideation. And so you really try it. In, in If you have a product, you're going to design something or other, well, design it with AI. Think of the AI as being like an assistant. And, of course, most students can't afford to hire an assistant to work with them. And that's what you do if you're like an art director or studio manager or something like that. But if you're just a low-level person just starting, you can't afford to hire another person just to help you, but you can definitely have, afford to hire an AI to help you. And AI is not as good as a, like, like a very skilled, many years experienced person. It's still early. It's still in the beginning stages, but AI can do surprisingly much for you. So that would be my recommendation that you learn it. You learn by doing. Don't learn by studying. I mean, you can definitely read articles online that recommend doing various things. I know I wrote some of them myself and many, many other people have written other articles about ideas for how to use AI. And, and that's that's worth spending some time reading some of that. I'll definitely say that. But I feel that the most beneficial thing to do is to just spend your time practicing or doing. Um, and then you learn from that. Then you get better and better and better. And then you also use your own ideas because then you start getting ideas, I could use it for this as well. And that could be something new that nobody else did in the past. But you get that idea. But you're not going to get the idea for something advanced if you haven't done kind of the beginning things first. You you start small, but start now. And then you gradually build up your expertise. And also as the tools get better, so next year, they'll be able to do so much more than they can now. And you'll be then ready to take advantage of these new features because you already understand the basic features because this year you learned the basic features. Next year you can learn the advanced features. Before we go ahead, here are some lessons we've learned so far. AI's revolution is probably bigger than the invention of the PC and internet. The industrial revolution replaced a lot of human manual effort. The PCs help people execute faster and at scale. The internet made communication faster than ever. Nobody fully knows what AI will do for us in the long term. But without a doubt, it's a huge trend shifter. Next, designers that understand their subject well and keep themselves updated will never be replaced. However, if you're too focused on execution and not ideation, then there's a huge chance that you might get outdated. Even today, a great designer is also focused on complementary skills like refining the problem statement, prioritizing the right issues, and then selling ideas to stakeholders. Your CTA is to start learning on how to use AI. We've already launched multiple free masterclasses on our channel and how to prompt.in. Next, Use AI for your first draft and not the last. Build on top of what AI gives you. Most people are expecting AI to be super smart and perfect. You cannot see AI as a smart replacement. See it like an intern who's slightly drunk. 
it's your job to validate the results given by AI. In the end, it is your responsibility to filter out all the fluff and build on top of what AI gives you. Next, AI will only make you lazy if you stop using your human creativity and judgment. You cannot ask AI to build your product end to end. You need to use it for guidance, direction and signals. AI is great at finding patterns, but it is your own judgment that will decide what patterns are relevant to your customers. It is not only about knowing what AI can do, it is also important to understand what AI cannot do. Next, don't learn just by studying theory. Learn by doing. Always make sure you practice what you learn and document all of your learnings. You'll be able to download a PDF of these notes for free via link in description. Now, let's go back to the episode. Are there some examples of like great prompts or prompting techniques that you use in your design process? Yeah, I feel like the two I really would recommend is just first of all, ask for many. I typically say 10, but you could easily ask for 20 as well. But but don't ask for just two, ask for 10, not ask for many versions of whatever you're doing. And then the, the second uh, I also want to encourage is to ask for, I tend to say very widely variable, but if you're doing like artwork, I say like the broad, broad, broad spectrum of artistic styles, then you may say, oh, I want to narrow it down. I want to do like a cartoon, a funny satirical cartoon. I want to do monochrome artwork, line artwork. I want to do like a painting type artwork. You get some ideas from that once you start start working with it. But in the beginning, I say, don't lock yourself down to be, be broad, be wide, because that's one of the things AI really supports. And again, going back to the example of if you had to do it with a human, very rarely you can hire a really great illustrator who can do, both do like an oil painting and certainly not an oil painting in, in 20, 10 seconds. And also a great you know, editorial cartoon like you see in the newspaper and a good photograph, photographic hyper-realistic style. But for AI, it can do all those three types of pictures in one prompt. You just ask for three styles and it comes. That's very, very cool. Asking for many as well. Yeah. A, a lot of students in our community are always worried about standing out. They're like, if AI comes in, the competition is going to go high. So what makes a really good UX designer? Like, what are some skills and mental models that students yeah. should practice moving forward? Oh, exactly. Well, you know, it, AI doesn't solve the real problem of user experience which is to figure out what should be done, how to support users. And, you know, you don't find out how to support users by asking them what do you want because they don't know. That's why they are not the designer. So that's our job to find out how to help them. Users are expert in being users, in, in doing their own job. So you can watch people do their job and you can see where they fail. You can see where they have clumsy workarounds and you can come up with saying, well, we should design a feature that does this thing and it'll save people an hours work. So that's an insight that, you know, your human, human can come up with. Uh, and then, you know, the details and specifics of how to design that, you can get a lot of help from AI. Yeah, the fundamental job that we have to do is to figure out what should be done. That's the most complicated part of UX, and that's also where you really stand out. And the really great solution is better than just like the surface solution. You can always have a surface solution that takes what we're already done, and you just put some buttons on it, and you make a nicer color scheme. But that's not a fundamental breakthrough in, in usability. Um, that requires a deeper insight. You can all of a sudden simplify things from being this complicated to being, ah, this simple. And once you have that, it's so-called obvious, because of course that's the solution. Well, it's obviously the solution after somebody created it, designed it. But before that happened, it was not obvious as proven by the fact that there are so many other people who designed that, that problem in a more complicated manner. And so there, that's, where you, that's where you can really, really stand out. You can stand out in really understanding users' problems in, in, in cutting to the bone in how to solve it. I mean, this is more simplicity. Those are some of the big, big, big slogans of user experience has always been. You know, you can always add more features. That's, well, there's a lot of programming work, but now again, programmers are twice as productive as they used to be. So adding more features is not a truly uh, differentiating factor, but, but having the features be simple. And also the other point about features is if there's a lot of features, but people cannot understand how to use them, they might as well not exist. So a lot of features that are complicated does nobody any good. But simple features, and that really makes life better and easier for the users. Now, that's beauty. Uh, and then, of course, you also want to make, make it look good and all these other uh, criteria. I mean, there's a lot of criteria, and, and user interface design is not as easy as, well, I actually see this back. 
in some ways, user interface design is easier today than it was, let's say, 40 years ago, because we have a lot more best practices and guidelines and just things we know about. So you don't have to invent everything from scratch. In that sense, it's easier. But in another sense, it's more difficult because the bar has been raised. So the user's demand for quality has increased dramatically. I mean, the products that actually sold quite well 40 years ago, if they came out today, nobody would want them. They, they, they were truly terrible. They were just the best we had back then. And so therefore people used them. But their quality has gone up a lot. And this is one thing I can say that's actually a happy conclusion that I have for my career. So I've been doing user experience for uh, 41 years. And so that back 41 years ago, computers were really terrible. And uh, 20 years ago, they were bad, but not that terrible. And today, they're still not perfect, but they're not as bad as they used to be. So it has been a clear, clear improvement in quality. Um, and I, I put, I'm certainly expect more of that to come. And I think that's another happy outcome of this AI point, because when we can improve the productivity and I talked about productivity of designers and of programmers both. That means we can have more design, more insightful design. We can try more things, reject the bad ones, do the good ones. And we can have our colleagues who are the developers uh, can actually make those things that might have been too complicated for them to do in the past. So increased productivity leads to increased quality for the end users. And again, that's our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to save humanity from being oppressed by computers. So we want to make technology adapt to humans, not humans adapt to technology. And this is very difficult because the two are very different. I mean, computers work in such a different way than, than humans do. And that's why we have all these design problems and so much work and all of them getting a good user experience. But the more productive we can be, the more we can approach this ideal. And I say approach because I don't think we're gonna have the perfect user interface even in 20 years but we'll have better than what we have now. And you've been in the game for 41 years? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it was bad back then, I'll tell you. And anybody who listens to this who's not as old as me, you can just be happy that you were not in computers uh, 41 years ago. I mean, honestly, the, the mainframes were so terrible and oppressive, and, and I can't imagine how people ever used them. And I guess, I guess they used them because they had to, because they were the only thing they had, but it was very oppressive very unpleasant. That's actually why I got into usability in the first place, because I was studying computer science at university. And my experience was that these big, big expensive computers, you know, that were the best they had at the time, they had them in the computer science department. They were so unpleasant to use. And I thought, well, it has to be possible to make something that's, that's more happy, more pleasant, more uh, humane, more oriented towards, towards users. And it certainly was. Even with that technology at the time, you could make better design than what was the norm that most people were using a soft, bad software. But then we've had a lot of technology advances as well over these 41 years. And uh, the graphical user interfaces are just better than mainframe user interfaces. Well, unless they're terribly designed. I mean, you can completely make a very terrible graphical user interface. But if you make a good one, you have a lot of advances in terms of uh, visualizing information rather than requiring people to remember information and type it correctly. So we have had a lot of technology advances that have helped us create better user interfaces. But then we also have had a lot of advances in our understanding of what makes for good or bad design in interaction. Because interaction design is very different than designing of, of static objects. And that was a big mistake I think people made in the beginning of the web, is they thought, oh, now we can sort of communicate to our customers, like here's like a web page. And then they thought we'll make the web page look like a magazine page. And that absolutely does not work. Because the magazine page, you just look at. You don't have to do anything with that magazine page. Whether it's an article or an advertisement, in, in either case, you don't do anything. You don't have to make any decisions other than turn the page, which is a very simple user interface. Keep turning the page. Of course, we all know on the web, you may click here, you may click there, you may type for search, you may do 50 other things. And very quickly, you are completely lost if it's poorly designed and you don't get anything done on that website. In fact, what we do know from many, many usability studies is that users just leave. If a website is difficult to use, they leave. And that's another thing that's different from if you have, let's say, a magazine, because in the old days, now this is the good old days where there was print magazines. So you had bought and paid for this and you maybe gone to a newsstand and bought, and bought it and then got taken it home, or maybe it came in the mail. In any case, you had this object in your hand. And that meant that getting a different magazine instead would be a complicated and also expensive thing to do. On the web, on the other hand, I'm looking at this web page, 
Well, if I don't like that, I click the back button, and now I'm back to something like Google. There's a list of 10 things, nine other ones, another click away, and I go there instead. And so the user situation is completely different. In addition to that, you know, interaction overhead of figuring out what to do. So, so the barrier to going in another place is very low online. It was very high in print. And on the other hand, the complexity of understanding how to use it is high on the computer and low in print. So that changes a lot in how you do the design. And I, I can certainly explain this here in the way that sounds very obvious, but it was not to be honest, obvious. Um, maybe 25 years ago or so when, when kind of the early web started and people make a lot of really bad websites. I mean, just like this example, you've taught us so many laws, right? And everybody agrees with them. Uh, but th are there any opinions that are against the normal odds? Like, are there any things that you believe in that everybody else says, no, this is not true? <laughs> well, um, there certainly have been cases like that over the years. And again, if we go back to sort of the early days of the web, I was very strong defender of things being very fast, so very fast response times. You know, the time between I click and I get should be you no know, less than one second for people to feel that they're moving freely on the website. And at the early days when people had these dial-up modems, that meant you could have very little graphics. And that was a lot of designers were very opposed to that insight. I just said it was an insight based on observing humans, and that's human behavior, that we want things to be fast. Uh, nowadays, luckily, we can have them be fast, even though then you have another problem, which is that sometimes the server is slow. It's not so much that there's a big picture. It's rather that the computer in the other end takes its time before it delivers it. And that's a problem also with some of the AI services. that they, Some of them are quite fast, like ChatGPT, and others uh, do take a long time to deliver what you want. And that is very unpleasant. So response times are an eternal you know, rule because they depend on the human condition, not on the computer, and how fast people want things to happen for them just to feel smooth and pleasant. So that was a lot of opposition to my, my insights 25 years ago, but I think today most people have um, have kind of accepted this. But um, then we sort of, sometimes history keeps repeating itself because right now I'm saying that, you know, it's not enough to use natural language in AI. So some people say, oh, it's just because it's chat, you can type and there's no usability problem. But that's not true because it just begs another question, which is what should I type? What should I say? I, we discussed this before, like you have to understand and know what you can say to the to the AI, what makes sense and what does not make sense. And so there's an articulation barrier to overcome, which is just as serious as other usability barriers. It's just something that's a new type of barrier, and therefore many people in the field, in the AI field, don't recognize that it's so serious. And, and again, why do they not recognize it? Because they are not typical average users. I mean, to be an AI scientist, you have to be like the top probably 1% or something like that of the population and brain power. And so if you have a very high IQ, that comes with, you know, being good at describing things and explaining things and writing things. But 99%, this is by definition, 99% of the population are not in the top 1%. And so you have a lot of people who have trouble with this. And, um, and that's something we have to explain and really, really um, make clearer because it's very normal for people to take their own experience as the characteristic of the user experience. Because after all, you know, I'm a human, I'm a user. If I like it, it must be good. No, it'll be good for people like you. But if you are like in the 1% outlier of the population, it's not going to generalize. And um, that's something that's so deep in uh, user experience people, because that's something we learned from the very beginning that you are not the user. And we got to study the actual people, the customers who are using our product. But for a lot of other people, you know, like uh, programmers or the people who started these AI companies because they're brilliant AI scientists and things like that, they haven't learned those lessons. And so it's, it's our job now to really communicate that and make them understand. And so right now, that's a little bit maybe of an unpopular message for some people that I say, well, you know, you would honestly have a lot of obvious usability problems that we can find in a day of usability testing. This is for some of the biggest companies are making mistakes that any UX expert, I wouldn't even say like a world-class expert, just like a normal expert can find in a day because they're so glaring. And so that is to me, very upsetting. But it is honestly just history repeats itself. So what should I expect? And this is how it always is. A new technology comes out, and in the beginning, you get a lot of bad designs implemented with that technology. That's always how it has been. 100%. 
the next question is not from the audiences but it's from me and my team so we have been educating indian students and students abroad about ai and design Good. and i wanted to get suggestions from you as to what all topics should we teach to our students now like what are some things that i should learn my team should learn so that you know those super super important things that everybody should learn yeah um well i mean there are, there are sort of two things right there's what you can do what you cannot do and they're both important actually because some of the things AI cannot do that I see some people trying to make it do is to sort of simulate users and you don't have to ever look at a real customer, but you just ask the AI, what would people do in this situation? But in that case, it's sort of guessing. And the reason we do user research is that humans are extremely unpredictable. And, you know, I always used to say that if you do a study and you don't have a surprise, that shows you did the study wrong because there are always surprises. I mean, you'd never know perfectly in advance what's going to happen when you get together with, with real humans. So that, I think, is an example of what AI does, does wrong. Other things AI does, does wrong, which I don't think is a bad problem, but the so-called hall hallucinations that are much discussed, which is, I mean, I've even had it on myself. I mean, I've you know, asked for fun to say, write me a biography of Dr. Jacob Nielsen, you know, and it comes out with saying, well, I graduated from this university that I never attended, or I work at this company that I never worked at. So it makes up things. Um, and that just shows you that you should not, if you wanted to write a biography of a famous person, just ask ChatGPT, give me a bio of, of this person, and you just use it. You have to, to, to double check or fact check it. But it can create, you know, like, give me like a short bio, give me a long bio, give me a bio written as a rap song or a haiku or something like that. And you're given different formats. And that's, again, that creativity aspect, uh, which is very, very good at. So I feel like like managing sometimes randomness, I think, is, a, is an important topic that is not much taught or was not much taught in the past because it was not something we needed to, to, to deal with, really. But with AI, we get a lot of things that are random. Sometimes we get sort of random fact that's not a fact, but it's wrong. Sometimes we get a lot of wacky or wild ideas from it. And we have to like learn how to discern, you know, what's good and bad and how to maybe sometimes combine two things into uh, that AI comes up with a third thing is actually the good design that we come up with. Uh, so, so those are skills that are that are new. I would say that were not much necessary in the in the past, but they definitely are now. That's super cool. And if there's a student who wants to learn more from you or from your articles, we know about UX Tigers. Uh, can you share more about your newsletter, or if there are any other free resources that a student can follow? Yes, I think to be honest, what I really would recommend is to sign up for my my newsletter because then it just comes to your email every week, and that's on Substack. But you can also, if you go to uxtigers.com website, is at the bottom of the page. But yeah, go to Substack, and and it's free, you know. So so go and and get that newsletter. And it's it's comes to your to your mailbox actually a few times a week because I'm writing a lot right now because I'm very inspired. Uh, so so that would really be the best thing to just get it get it you know, as get it as it's fresh 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 from you know here. So um, and there's a lot of information coming. So so keep keep up with it. It's really a good good recommendation. Now before we end this episode, let us learn everything we've learned so far in the second half. Number one, as a designer, you need to recognize what is that 20% that brings you the 80% of the results. Adding more features to a product is never the solution. People need outcomes and not just features. They need things to be simpler and easier. If users cannot understand your features, those features might as well not even exist. Next, it is not enough to use a natural language for AI prompts. You need to be extremely specific. Majority of prompting is just about adding context and setting constraints. It's like teaching a new intern as to how to think and navigate. Please make sure you practice how to add the right context and constraints in your prompts. You'll be able to download a PDF of all of these notes for free via link in description. Make sure you click on subscribe and hit the bell icon because that helps us stay motivated. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sir Jacob, for doing this. Uh, I really, really respect you for everything that you've done for the community. And uh, folks, if you are watching this episode right now, please make sure that you document your notes and share with us what you learned from this episode. Put your notes on LinkedIn, tag me and Sir Jacob, and we would love to see what you've learned and your takeaways. Let us know in the comments section if you have any other doubts, any other concerns, and I can put them all together and try to answer them from this episode. Uh, with that being said, thank you so much, sir, for coming on the show, and I hope you have a great year ahead.
ahead. Thank you so much, and you too, and also to the entire audience. And I really want to emphasize that it's just an incredibly exciting time to be in user experience because there was a time, like sort of about a 10-year period, where it was sort of about the same every year. And, you know, that was nice, but a little bit boring. Now it's moving. And I feel that that's very, very exciting. And the beauty is that we are still at the beginning of that explosion, that revolution, which means if you get with the program now, and again, this is my recommendation, start right away. If you get with it now, then in two years, you'll be one of the only people in the world with two years experience. And that's when it's going to be really big and really exciting. So it's just it's just honestly a wonderful time to be at the birth of a revolution. Think about if you've been like a steam engine person back when the steam engine was invented. You might have been the person to invent the locomotive, right? So think about that equivalent idea that you're going to do now, you're going to do next year. That is super powerful. And in the next two years, you'll be the only person with two years of experience. <laughs> that is incredible. Thank you so much, sir. And I hope you have a great year ahead. Thank you so much, you too. If you liked watching this podcast, then do check out this episode as well. I am super sure that you will again find a lot of inspiration.